So uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning to wherever you may be in the world. Uh, my name is Brian Dean and I am very excited to bring you uh, December's Network and Learn uh, uh, installment of, of from the UDL IRN. And our topic this, uh, this time around is where in the world is UDL? A little play on words for Carmen San Diego for you fans of the 80s. Um, and so we've brought together some really, really great uh, panelists. Uh, to kind of talk about uh, implementation in classrooms throughout the world and, and the UDL movement at large. Um, so without further ado, I, I'd like to get into that and I'm gonna share my screen with you all uh, so that you can um, uh, see uh, kind of our protocol. I'll take us through it. Let me just go into present here real quick. Move this guy over, sorry everyone. There we go. <clears throat> Uh, so again, this is our December Network and Learn from the UDL IRN Network, UDL uh, Implementation Research Network, and uh, we're talking about where in the world is UDL. Um, to follow along, we'd love you to follow us on social media. If you just ty uh, type in the hashtag UDL IRN, uh, you'll be able to keep up with the conversations. Please, as, as our panelists are kind of going through... Um, uh, their presentation portion of our webinar. Webinar. Remember that it is interactive, and what we like to do is we uh, would have you tweet in your questions or, or submit your questions if you're in the actual webinar chat. Um, but if you can, if you can um, go ahead and tweet those out uh, using the hashtag #UDLIRN. Um, one of my uh, two compadres will be more than happy to comp, uh, pull those together in a compilation and then ask the presenters. So I'm Brian Dean. I'm the moderator for this evening. Uh, I work in Michigan uh, in the United States and um, I'm on the board of directors for UDLIRN. Um, tonight's panelists are Chrissy Butler uh, from New Zealand, uh, Inclusive Education Universal Design for Learning Consultant and Accredited Facilitator for Core Education. And then Jennifer Cates, a PhD from assistant professor out of University of British Columbia and developer of the three block UDL model. Um, so I wanna welcome them and we'll get to them uh, in a moment. I also wanna give a shout out to uh, Sue Harden uh, and Corinne Howard, powerful, powerful uh, individuals who will be coordinating our Twitter uh, and chat moderation and getting those questions that you, that you send to us, uh, getting those compiled and asking those later. Um, in the in the webinar. So <clears throat> with that, uh, I just want to say hello to everybody. Um, Jennifer, it's good to see you again. We've uh, done some work together. I'm very, very uh, yeah. uh, blessed to have done some work with you. And Chrissy, we have only met uh, through, uh, through virtual conferencing, but the work that we've done together, I'm very excited about too. So welcome cool. both of you. I'm so excited. Uh, I want to, I don't want to stumble over my words and I, I don't want to, um, because uh, because I'm fanboying a little bit, I just want to be honest. So, <laughs> so I'm going to let you introduce yourselves and kind of where you're from, work that you that you're currently engaged in, and then we'll jump into kind of our our talk and, and our uh, kind of the system by which we do that. So, if you, if you could go first, Chrissy, and then um, Jennifer, follow up after that. Okay, kia ora, um, which is hello um, from New Zealand. Um, so I'm Chrissy Butler. I'm based in Wellington in, um, in the south of the North Island of New Zealand. Um, I work with uh, a, a beautiful bunch of people at a place called uh, Core Education Tata Ahoro. Um, the Tata Ahoro at the end is, a, is an analogy around weaving. So about the, our diversity together gives us our strength. So um, I work in the uh, inclusive education, universal design for learning space um, and have had a kind of varied journey here um, with kind of a big portion of that in the arts. So that's me. Well, thank you very much, Chrissy and, and, and Jennifer, if you could tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Hey, I'm Jennifer Cape. I, um, started off living in Winnipeg. I grew up there and then moved out here to the West Coast. I'm in Vancouver at this time. Beautiful city, love it here. And uh, working as a professor, so both the research and the practical sort of end of, of UDL. And uh, I've been working with Brian and, and collaborating with CAS for since 2011. So about six years now that we've been interacting and, and I've learned a ton. So I just want to say thank you for the inclusiveness that CAST has shown 
And uh, I'm looking forward to tonight and just having a conversation and listening to Chris. Yeah, and and I like I said before, I might be fanboying a little bit here, but I'm I'm very excited because I think that both of your models uh, and concept, you know, your conceptual models around UDL are very interesting um, and and hold true, but have you know like hold true to to uh, uh, you know cast kind of a beginning model, but but then have really very unique kind of um, interpretations that I that I to me I find that. I find that really beautiful and powerful about UDL. So, um, so again, thank you both so much for being here. Uh, for those of you that are new to, um, to our network and learns, I really just kind of want to share with you uh, kind of how we run our protocol um, before we get into it. Uh, we run our protocol in a 20-20-20 system. It's an hour long, so um, we got about 55 minutes left. Uh, and we run kind of, we change this protocol up from time to time, but really we're gonna let um, Chrissy have some conversation and kind of present what's happening in, in, in New Zealand. And then we're gonna take some questions from you folks out there in, in the Twitterverse and, and the interwebs, wherever you may be. And then uh, we're gonna have uh, uh, Dr. Kate step, step up and, and present her side and then, or present her piece. And then uh, we'll take some more questions and then we'll open it up to some further conversation. Um, so with that, Again, our hashtag is UDLIRN, uh, just very simple. Just tag that into any question you may have uh, and uh, Sue or, or Corinne will tag those and, and kind of catalog those. Um, and so uh, without further ado, um, I, I would like to uh, offer the floor up to Chrissy and I'll go into a full presentation and you tell me to move forward and what you need me to do. All right. Cool, I'll marvelous. Me... All right. I'll let you get there. Brilliant. So first slide, please, Brian. Awesome. So, so this little talk really is about UDL in Aotearoa, New Zealand. Aotearoa is the indigenous name for New Zealand and we're um, kind of situated in the south of the South Pacific. And right now it is so hot, um, it would melt your car. It is seriously hot here, worryingly hot. Um, but um, greetings to all you um, with your jumpers and hats and woolies on in um, the Northern Hemisphere. Um, so I just want to tell you that a little bit about um, our journey, but I want to acknowledge from the outset really that um, if, if you imagine a weave, um, I, I'm one thread, one strand, and so this is my perspective on the whole. Um, others would have maybe quite a different story, but this is mine. So next slide, please, Brian. So, so for me, the UDL journey personally has been like very curvy. Um, and I think for us here in Aotearoa in New Zealand, it, it continues to be this, you can't totally see the way ahead, but you just keep going. Um, and what I just want to do is to just share a little bit about what what we've done, um, how we've got there and why we're going to keep going. So next slide, Brian. So really UDL here has come kind of by magic. Um, a small group of educators in many different roles around the country fell over UDL um, and thank goodness cast put work online um, and yourself, Jennifer, too, because otherwise we would have remained in the dark. Um, and so a few of us bumped into it. And um, if you flick the next slide, Brian, we, we started to try stuff. We, we tried stuff in our own context as teachers, as facilitators work, working in assistive technology. And just over time, and especially with the, um, that increase in um, digital technologies, we started to share um, share at workshops um, and then connect with each other um, and that went on for quite a few years and then next slide Brian and then really a kind of big watershed was um, a few of us found ourselves in the right place at the right time um, and had an opportunity to work with the Ministry of Education to really build the first inclusive education website in New Zealand um, you know, what does inclusive practice look like? Um, and because we had that kind of 
novice UDL learning, we designed the site using UDL principles. The very first, the, the website is a set of guides and the very first guide was a guide on UDL where we borrowed or stole all the information from the US and Canada, your, your own Jennifer, and we, we pushed it, pulled it together um, and said, this is UDL. And then a couple of years later, um, we had the opportunity to review that guide um, and we wrote really our first New Zealand UDL guide. We illustrated the guidelines with um, stories from our own schools and our own settings. And that's, that's been pretty, that's quite a significant milestone. Um, and that little video there, um, which, we, which you can watch later, um, was the first time that um, Go the Ministry, we got an opportunity to um, kind of make an animation around what are the links between Universal Design for Learning and our New Zealand curriculum? Like, why are we doing this? And so that was really brave, I think, of the ministry, a tiny little team in our ministry who are so awesome. Um, and um, that's, that's created like a little collection of work that we can use. Next slide, Brian. And so this is the last slide of the what section. So really you from based on that collection of materials um, and our own conversations um, and the weave, quite a few different things have started to happen over the, the last few years. Like UDL is, if you um, look at those circles from left to right in an arc, um, UDL has got embedded in our specialist teacher training. Um, and many national facilitators across the country are aware of UDL or it underpins what they do. Um, those of you that work in universities or um, for um, companies know that when a contract comes out and you have to fill in the forms, lots of them, um, lots of that comes, when it comes from the ministry now, it asks for UDL to be embedded in a way of working. And so at that systems level, it's beginning to get traction. We have a national network of resource teachers that have been introduced to UDL. Um, across our teachers, we have everything from nobody knows anything to exposure to people that are immersed in that space. And I think one of the most exciting one is the little research bubble on the end there. Um, we, we have no formal research really in Aotearoa New Zealand around UDL. However, an increasing number of um, teachers when they take sabbaticals or go on study leave, UDL has become their focus. Um, that's what they've spent a year digging into. So I think that's pretty cool. Um, next slide. So, for me, this is kind of the heart of our story, my little story, which is, so how does a girl from England um, bring a framework from the United States and Canada to Aotearoa, New Zealand? Like, how, do, how does UDL travel to the other side of the world? Um, and that has been a huge part of the journey for me personally. Um, and I think on reflection, it's really been guided by the guidelines themselves. Um, so next slide, Brian. So I just wanna give you a couple of examples. So in indigenous culture here for Māori, for the Māori people, a, a really, when, when you meet together at a meeting, um, one of the very first things you do is introduce yourselves. Who, who are you and to whom do you connect? Um, and one of the first times in the place I work at CORE, we, we have a big, a big part of our family is Māori. Um, and one of the first times I went to that to introduce UDL, um, it was like, actually there's an opportunity here to model it. So when you introduce yourself, you do in English or in the Māori language, but it was like, 
actually, you can't see what's in my head, especially as I come from somewhere quite alien. But if I show you with photographs, this is my mountain, then it's like, oh, actually, I haven't, my mountain looks a bit like that. And, and it creates the beginnings of connection. So that mo modeling representation, that authentic um, kind of weaving and binding together, like it's a tiny little thing, but in my own journey with UDL, it's been really significant. Next slide, Brian. This is part of a little slide deck. Um, so the concept of universal design for eating. Um, Katie Novak, who many of you know, um, when she introduces UDL to people, she often talks about preparing a meal for 20 people you don't know. That's a kind of stock story. And we totally have grabbed it by to with two hands. Um, so here for uh, indigenous peoples and, and in the Pacific generally, um, there is this idea and it's, it's a, it will be an unfamiliar word to you in the States and, and Canada, but there is a word called manakitanga and it means to make welcome. It's, it's like a, and it's highly, highly valued. And so when we introduce UDL, this thing of, you know, how do you plan? How do you create, sh prepare food for 20 people you don't know? What would be in your head? Obviously that predictable variability and that it's in us already. Um, and so that connection of building on what we already know and do, um, but also that the that universal design for eating and, and universal design for learning is, is about courtesy. It's about expecting and valuing diversity. And so, like for me, one of the things that's been really important is you, you know, UDL, you can get stuck in the UDL and technology. You can't do UDL without the tech. Or, you know, UDL is about some piece of paper or but it, you know, it's about people um, and, it, and it really doesn't matter what the context is. It's still about people and how can we make this work? Next slide, Brian, nearly there. Um, for some of you UDL old hands, this will be a little diagram that you hold deeply to your hearts. The planning for all learners. Um, and when I first bumped into UDL, it was kind of like, okay, right, how am I going to float that here? Um, uh, because it doesn't like grab you, does it? I like, you know, um, especially if some of the words are not familiar um, and the flow is not familiar. Um, so if you, yeah, spirals is good. But if you flick to the next slide, Brian. Um, this, this was my interpretation and I own this diagram. You're not really supposed to change the research just by giving a tweak, but, um, for me, I personally needed to make the people visible in the cycle. Um, when we plan with universal design for learning it has to start from the people, even if something else has brought you to the table, like we want to look at this or that it's like okay, we get together. Now, who are you? And, and what's happening for you? And so, so for example, if I work with, a, if I'm going to do a workshop with a school for a day, and, and I'm talking with the people planning, you know, I'll ask about, you know, who's going to be there? And what's morale like? And what's on top? And who are the people, you know, that that's where you have to start. Um, so that cycle has really has continued to guide um, a way of working here. Um, and it, it still shapes um, where how I work. Um, and next one, Brian. And so this is kind of penultimate slide. Um, uh, one of the things that's been 
a kind of the big journey for me is again like I said before like being a girl from England in a cultural context that, it, that where I'm not indigenous you know the you know in my heart I might think actually this is really good for you UDL is good for you it but it's like it's not my place to to impose a framework all I can think of is colonizing like almost which seems the antithesis of what we're trying to to do but it I earlier in the year I heard a colleague speak um, a, a Māori colleague speak about universal design for learning and its connections to our treaty documents here and I spoke to her yesterday on Skype and she said this UDL has allowed people to see inequity in places and spaces where they hadn't considered it before and she was talking about schools it's given a it's it's opened conversations and she said for me as Māori it's given us a doorway to talk about the treaty and inequities for Māori because it like the conversation hasn't started with let's talk about race the conversation has st started with actually let's talk about learners and families and trying to make things work for people and so it's opened a door and so that that was hugely powerful for me um and then one more slide brian and so this is my closing slide for my little slot so um this is one of the um screenshots from the video that we made around the new zealand curriculum and universal design for learning um, and I, I think it's it encapsulates our why like we have really significant diversity as we do everywhere and we know that every learner learns differently depending on context and we you know as a education sector we want to make it work um, and we've given New Deal a go um, and it's making sense and um, we're only at the beginning, but I think um, it has huge value here. Yeah, that's where we are. I was I was muted the whole time, which is probably good because because there were a lot of oh yeah yes yes right and and uh, be be keep me telling you to keep preaching. Um, I I gotta tell you, Christy, you, you just. You, you blew my mind with some of the things because they're so beautiful and so simple. Um, but, but that term, that, that idea of UDL as a courtesy, what, what a beautiful, yeah. like very familial way, right. Um, of, of kind of framing um, universal design and that it's allowed us, it's opened up this way to talk about inequities, but not talk about them with the first conversation of race, but more to talk about them in, yeah. in, how are we moving together as a people? Oh, as, uh, it was it was so brilliant. Thank you so much. It, it really opened my eyes, um, and and I think that it, it probably opened uh, opened up a lot of questions on the on the out in Twitter and in 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 the chat. So I'm gonna um, I could wax on, uh, but <laughs> I'm gonna slow myself down, and I, I'm gonna turn to our to our members out there. Um, uh, so uh, I'm going to go to Sue first and Sue, see if there's uh, anything kind of happening out there in the, in the Twitterverse. Thanks, Brian. Uh, actually, yes, we have lots of people, lots of action on Twitter this evening. Christy, lots of people retweeting your comments and sharing their passion, their, their interest in your passion too, and um, restating the, the powerful things you said. We haven't had any com questions come in yet. So I posted another um, uh call for questions coming in, but I think there might be one or two in the chat. So I'm going to turn off my video and, put, and give it over to Corinne. Corinne, excuse me. Yeah, so uh, Chrissy, that was a um, just like Sue and Brian said, powerful presentation. Lots of, um, I guess, it would be chat style head nodding going on as well. Lots of people <laughs> resonating with the things that you've said. One of the questions that came through was, um, about you, you spoke about how this started with a small kind of group of, of educators and kind of a little bit about who was your first follower in this journey and what was it that really attracted them to this passion of yours, to what you brought? 
That's funny because that that's in relation to particular that video, isn't it? That first follower kind of thing. I, to be honest, I don't know. I there, I have some really close colleagues. Um, so Linda Ojala and Lynn Silcock. Um, Lynn really um, herself and Joy Zabala, who is at Cast in that assistive technology space, I think we're really cutting cutting the path way before I kind of caught up. Um, myself and Linda Ojala. Linda Ojala is someone when you see our videos from New Zealand around UDL classroom practice, that's the first place we made videos. And both Linda and I worked from the blind and low vision space to start with. Um, I, I, I actually don't know. Uh, the follower thing. Um, I think it's been, there are a lot of curious educators here who are, there's a lot of in, innovation around technology. Um, and because we have such a rich cultural space, but a lot of inequity, it's kind of like, you know, we've got to make this work. That's, yeah. So that's I my just, answer. Just for our viewers again, Christy, if you could put a if you could put a time frame a, a, around the start to where you are now, how many years are we looking at? I think in terms of kind of um, eight, seven or eight, really. Um, that's uh, that's pretty incredible. Right, like, like I don't know if you ever sit back and you look at it and you go, "Wow, we're, we're making progress," um, um, or if you look at it and you go, "That's really quite incredible." You have, you have, you have a national movement that is really becoming about more than just really education, but is about education because education mm -hmm. is everything. And you have that up and moving and, and uh, fo folks out there who have not visited the core site, please make sure you do so. We'll post it up at the end as well. Um, but, but to have that depth that you folks have um, and to have so many pieces from research all the way to, you know, uh, to the ministry involved, to all these different pieces involved in seven, eight years, that's, that's pretty incredible. You ever, you ever kind of blown away by that or? Or you just I think the there was no. <laughs> I think there, you know, there's sometimes the universe smiles, you know, and um, we had like the there. There was two or three key people in our ministry um, who were really brave and courageous and have such a vision for for inclusive ways of being and a few of the rest of us happened to be in the, the right place at the right time. And for, in, with my own, with core education, my own company, I don't think they really had any idea, but they, they let us run. And, and so it has, it has grown through trust really. Yeah. And some cool innovators. Well, yeah, that's the thing, you know, like we here in the States, we, uh, we often are looking uh, Australia, New Zealand and saying there's lots of really, really amazing things that are happening. Uh, and there seems to be a freedom, uh, a different kind of freedom um, in, in New Zealand and, and Australia um, around experimenting with education and, and learner centered environments and what that means and really chasing after yeah. those and, um, and, and really being able to sit with it for some time. You know, being able to sit with it and say, how is this going to work out? Let's let's really watch it and see if it plays out, you know, uh, and then how do we reiterate that? You know, how do we go through iterations of that and, and how do we change those things? And and um, uh, so so maybe it's just a, it's partly the cultural piece. But but I mean, that's really some it's an impressive body of work, in, especially considering the time frame, hmm. especially considering I think Oh, I'm sorry. We did have one other question come in to you, Chrissy. Um, someone uh, on Twitter, Ju um, Julie Kuhn, is asking about your, um, to talk a little bit about your UDL birds. Birds. Yes. I, I suspect I had to Google it. So ah. I think I did find it. Um, but they're the bird images that you use to talk about um, other kids, students in your class and how you um, look at diversity. Do you know, yeah. do you know what you're talking about? Yeah, I do. I do know the work. The work's not 
not not mine. Um, that's uh, a colleague, Lynn Silcock, has has developed that, and we can totally put you in touch. We can do that through the Twitter Twitter chat. Yeah, great. So if you can, we I can do that with you, Sue, afterwards. Okay, super. Thank you. Cool. All right, folks. Well, uh, so I'm going to uh, switch us over now, switch gears a little bit, uh, and and talk about another innovative set of practices and, and really just impressive work uh, that's happening uh, happening up in Canada. And um, I'm going to let uh, Jennifer Cates uh, go ahead and take that uh, and run run with her piece. So, uh, Jen, are you are you ready? I'm ready. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, absolutely. So right. I am. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen again and uh, mute myself so that you don't hear me going, "Ooh, ah, oh yes, yes," uh, over and over again and be distracting. Um, and then now uh, you just signal when you need me to change slides. All right. Will do. Okay, so we'll start with the first slide if you go to the next one, Brian. Um, so I, I thought, you know, many of you have already heard from me um, through the IRN and through various pieces. So rather than kind of go through the whole history, I thought I would do a, a short piece about that and then actually kind of do an update on where are we and, and what's new um, for us here. So um, the, the title in Soling Our Schools is the title of a new book that's coming out. So I thought I would just kind of introduce that to people. And uh, if you go to the next slide, Brian. So to go backwards in time, I came to UDL through the lens of inclusion. I was a classroom teacher at the time with in a very diverse school. And when I say diverse, I mean everything from culture to language to ability to you name it. We had kids from 57 different countries in the school. We had huge diversity. And I was simply trying to figure out how do I meet the needs of my students? It, it was really pretty much that simple. And I had a master's degree in special ed, but I quickly realized that what worked in a classroom with a one to four ratio wasn't going to work in a classroom with a one to 28 ratio. And so I started, I went back to do my PhD really um, just with the question of how do we make inclusion work? And for me, I had a vision of what it was I wanted for my classroom. The first part of which was a social aspect of inclusion. And I very much fit with Chrissy talking about this is about people and, and children are social beings and it's a big part of coming to school. And I wanted a classroom where all of the kids were part of the interactions and did so in positive pro-social ways. Um, dealing with all the issues of bullying and respecting diversity and all of those kinds of things. So one part of the vision was how do I create a classroom where my students work together, interact together, and support each other um, in positive, positive social ways. Next slide. The second part of inclusion was the academic piece. And I think we'd done a lot around social inclusion. We certainly weren't all the way there yet, but we had done a piece around it. But academic inclusion was far more challenging and far more controversial at the time that I'm talking about. Um, and when we're looking at, at academic inclusion, we're looking at how do I design my curriculum and my learning environment in such a way that all of my students can be part of it. And not, I used to talk about the metaphor of Piaget, like not in a parallel play way where when we do math, Johnny does math, but Johnny does math at the back of the room and he's doing a different math than us and he's not really part of us, but rather how do I design that math activity so that the student is learning to count to 10 and the student who's, you know, multiplying fractions or whatever it is can both be a part of what we're doing. And, and that was a big question for me. And as I looked at this piece, recognizing that if I looked at who is not included in my classroom, it was not about disability per se, right? The diversity of my class meant I had kids who were academically successful, but who, if you asked them, would have said they had no friends and, and therefore weren't socially included. And I had other kids who got along very well socially, but weren't able to do 
the learning activities as they were designed when, if they were designed in traditional ways. So I went looking for what's going to help me design that learning environment, both socially and academically, in such a way that I can have all of my students be an active part of the community. That, that's the lens that I came. So I came via inclusion to UDL. Next slide. So ultimately, as I dug into it, I kind of came up with this definition, so to speak. And it was more for my own sake in terms of wanting to figure out, so what is it I want? So that then I could go looking for strategies or whatever it was that were going to help me get there. And that idea that from a social inclusion standpoint, there was an intrapersonal piece and an interpersonal piece. So I wanted my students to have a positive self-worth, to feel good about who they were and feel like they had something of value to offer. And then I wanted them to have a sense of belonging and connection with other kids in the class. So the social inclusion had that inter and intra. And then it, when I looked at the academic inclusion piece, there was the piece around cognitive challenge. And by that, I kind of meant the Gottskian, you know, zone of proximal development. And it, in other words, giving kids learning opportunities, where they were, what they were ready for, and moving forward from there. So what was cognitively challenging to one is different than what's cognitively challenging to another. But then that social learning piece was the, was the kind of big piece, because if I wanted my students to be doing it together, then how do I provide challenge in such a way that this kid is, is kind of working where they are ready for, and this kid is working where they are ready for. And I had students who didn't speak English. I had, you know, so there were multiple aspects to that in order for them to engage, right? And so that's what I, those four green circles were sort of what I call the pillars, right? That when I'm looking for what is it, if somebody says, I've got this strategy, to me, it's like, well, is it going to help the kids feel good about who they are? Is it going to help them feel connected to each other? Is it going to provide an opportunity to learn? And can they do it together rather than the student having to leave with an educational assistant or whatever the case may be? Next slide. So that's when I came across UDL, right? And I, I came across the work that CAST was doing, and I got excited. Right? I got excited because it seemed like this was going to help me do that design. Right? And, and so I came into UDL from that, how do I meet the needs for my students? Right? That's, and I came across the, the multiple means, and I liked that it was brain-based and that there was a cognitive uh, science component, neuroscience component to that, um, and that it helped me to think about how I was going to work with my students. I saw UDL initially um, as really helping me with that academic inclusion piece. I wasn't sure, and, and, and this is just, it was my own, not ignorance, but beginning naivety as I began into the model, I didn't see it really helping me design the social piece or fully designing the social emotional piece. And so if we go to the next slide, I then came across the work of CASAL, right, which is the Collaborative for Social and Emotional Learning and the work of Daniel Goldman and Mark Greenberg and all of those people. And I kind of went, okay, so there's this piece, there's that SEL piece. And then there's this piece, which is the how do I design my learning environment? And I looked, and it's funny that you use the word weave, Chrissy, because that's the word I've always used. How do I weave these two things together? And I knew there were intersections. I knew that UDL did have a social and emotional component. And I knew that Cassell's work had a learning and instructional component. But it was, how do we find those? Because for me as a teacher on Monday morning, how do I do both of these things in my classroom, right? It, it, the theory and the frameworks and the planners and all of those things are wonderful. But there's a practical Monday morning, what does this look like in my classroom that was where I went. So if we go to the next slide, I saw my job as a weaving, right? And I always talk about weaving the loom. I did not make up SEL. I did not make up UDL, right? I was mentored by people in Cassell and I was mentored by David Rose 
And I give full credit to both of those groups because what the three block model is not anything new per se. It is what it is is a synthesis and a weaving together of the work of Cassell and the work of Cass and, and trying to find where are the intersections in these two pieces, right? And, and working through that. So that's what I was trying to do. So if you look at the next slide, this became, and it, it's ever changing, but this became sort of the graphic organizer, if you will, of the three block model. And really what I was doing was reading all the research on effective practices and saying, okay, so how does this fit? Block one became that social emotional learning, social inclusion piece and saying, what are the strategies? What are the things I need to think about? And, and the multiple means of engagement came into here as did Cassell's work come into here um, in terms of developing that self-worth and belonging that was really my big goal within that block. And then the second block was the inclusive instructional practice which um, really gave me so that, how do I design my curriculum, right? And, and the learning and academics of that. And I took all of those things, you know, that again, none of which I made up, but everything from flexible groupings and cooperative learning and differentiated instruction and understanding by design and inquiry and, and you know, all of those things and said under a UDL umbrella, that idea of how do I do this with all my kids rather than the special ed lens of, how do I design for this kid or for this kid, right? But that, you know, plan the dinner for 20 people kind of thing. Um, that I was looking at all that research and saying, so where, how do we look at inquiry as an example through a UDL lens, right? Or how do we look at differentiation or how do we look at whatever? And so that became the block two. And then the block three, honestly, initially was just a parking lot. It was like all the stuff that was in the research that I as a teacher had no control over, right? I could control block one and block two, but I didn't control the district policy or the budgeting or the staffing or the any of that kind of stuff. And so it was really part of that bigger piece of implementation and scaling and all of that kind of stuff that as a classroom teacher, I knew nothing about and frankly didn't care about at that time. I mean, I do now, but at that time, I wasn't concerned about it at all. Go to the next slide. Um, and you just have to keep hitting. There was a moment, all of that went on from what, 2000 and, well, from 2003 is when I started to do all of that work. Um, and then last a couple of years ago, listening to David, and I think last year was when he came out with this real sort of statement about uh, when he did his fireside chat at the end of the IRN. And we had spent the whole conference talking about how do we measure and how do we know if people are doing UDL and how do we, we've done all this stuff. And as is typical of David, he was very quiet through the whole sort of three days. And then suddenly at the end said, came out and made a number of statements that kind of blew my mind. And the first thing he said was that UDL is measured by the extent to which it's a disruption to education. And it, 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 in other words, you can't just measure this in the traditional scientific ways. It has to be creating change. It has to be impacting our world, the world of schools, the world of, of education. And that was like, it was almost like he gave me permission to stop pretending that I wasn't a rebel in that sense and be free to say, yeah, actually, I, I'm not buying into the system, right, in that sense. If you go to the next slide, um, and you're going to have to sort of go through these. So I, I put the picture in there not to kind of name drop or, or idol worship, although there is a little bit of that, admittedly. Um, but more to give credit, because I, I want the credit to go to David that he deserves. Um, and so this is not my work or my words, these are his. But some of the questions he posed while he was talking there really spurred a lot of thinking in me about where we need to go now, right, with, the, with UDL and with the three block model. And when he talked about things like, how do we measure that we have changed students' lives? 
and if they will learn this way for the rest of their lives, right? Which is very different from, you know, operationally defining UDL and, you know, all of that kind of traditional research paradigm. And how do we measure outcomes that translate into students wanting to relive their classroom learning and so forth? And so you can see there were a lot of questions. And if you hit enter one more time, Brian, the one that really stuck, struck me was this quote that came from David, where he said, how do we measure the birth of Picasso? And that for me resonated like in my boat. It was this, yes, that is what I've always been wanting to do was to set my students free to be the gift that they are. And that was like, yeah, how do I, and I'm a researcher, that's part of what I do now. Like, you know, I started as a teacher, but now I do research. How do we research the impacts of UDL in ways that are, on the one hand, reasonably valid in terms of a research paradigm, but on the other hand, not so limited by traditional research paradigms that we're boiling it down to statistics and, and all of those things and not capturing that, that richness, that beauty, right? That is a child in the making. Um, and so that spurred me forward. If we go to the next slide. Um, I started thinking about, so disruption to what? What is it I want to disrupt, right? Because I do want to be disruptive in that sense, but how do we disrupt? One of those was the whole, that's how we've always done things, you know, mindset. Another was what we believe about those kids, whether that's a racial bias or it's a disability bias or it's a whatever, or gender or anything else. Um, a disruption to the whole accountability agenda. They, that, I think we've gone down a horrible road as educators and as a profession with this whole standardized testing, scores, blah, blah, blah kind of stuff. Um, and, and in the end, the truth is I am a, a good Canadian left-wing socialist and I do want to disrupt segregation and discrimination and oppression. And, and there's lots of that everywhere in the world right now, including here, even though Canadians like to pretend there isn't. If we go to the next slide. So what do I need? I started to look at, you know, I had had this vision of what did inclusion look like in my classroom. And now it was like, well, what do I need from a school, a schooling and educational sense? And what I realized was, Oops, go back one. There we go. I had done this exercise with teachers, with parents, with all kinds of people where I had them write down the 10 things that they felt were the most important characteristics for students to leave the system with. And they always boiled down. Nobody ever says the most important thing for kids to graduate with is their timetables. Or, and nobody says to be obedient rote learners or to, you know, and yet that's what our whole system virtually gets caught up in. Right. And so to capture the what do we want, what do we actually want and, and then do our practices fit with that? Are we creating? We say we want critical thinkers and problem solvers and so on. Well, do our practices actually create that? We say we want respectful citizens and, and leadership and all of those things. Well, does the way that we teach in our classrooms actually, you know, support those things. So this was the new vision of if this is what we want. Um, and this was a synthesis of what teachers all over the world have told me when I've done this work. Um, then we have to rethink what things look like in our classrooms and in our schools, because most of our traditional practices do not create this. They don't foster critical thinking. They foster rote, obedient <laughs> learners, right? Like it's, there's a lot of things we're doing that don't fit with what we say we want for our students. Okay, next slide. So there were the original two books, right? Teaching to Diversity was my first book, which was about sort of in the classroom, what does this look like? Resource Teachers was my second book, which was really the tier two, tier three. How do we look at the kids with different learning challenges, but look at them through a UDL lens rather than 
that locating all the disability in the individual and how do we design programs for them. The third book, which I had already begun working on, but now working through that, if we go to the next slide, I had begun to work with indigenous communities. And so I co-wrote this third book that's coming out soon called Ensouling Our Schools, which now takes an indigenous lens on UDL. Right, so it's looking at that worldview that Canadian indigenous peoples, and there's many different nations here, so I can't broad brush stroke all of the nations, but some of the nations I was working with, um, what, how they had informed my thinking. And, and Kevin Lamru, who you see on here, is an indigenous educator, and now the education lead for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission here in Canada. So we work together to look at UDL from a different kind of worldview. So if we go to the next slide, and I know we're running out of time, I just want to sort of give you a little picture of this lens that Indigenous elders sort of gave me in terms of that schooling and education should be about living a life of meaning and purpose. What is how do we help our students figure out what would feel meaningful and purposeful to them? What, what would be a fulfilling life for them? And that concept that, you know, if we can teach kids prejudice and discrimination and ethnocentrism, we could also teach them peacefulness and acceptance and respect. That all of these things can be taught the whole idea of well boys will be boys or whatever as though it's like we have to just accept that is not actually true go to the next slide um the concept of mino pima Tisawin, which is a, a, a prairie uh first nation concept in in canada which talks about leading a good life and the equivalent of it is walking in a good way, which is really interesting because it's this piece of, unlike it being independence and you know, self-actualization, it's actually community actualization. And it's that idea of, I came, the creator gave me a gift and my job is to develop that gift and then contribute it to my community. It's not good enough just to develop it and, and benefit from it yourself, your community has to benefit from that gift. And so looking at universal design through that lens, right, of how, how do we universally design a learning environment that teaches children to see service and giving to community as equally valuable, right, to self-actualization. And that idea that it's interdependence not independence that we're actually trying to develop and that's a very different kind of lens and so if you go forward again um, what's interesting is that Maslow's triangle which we all have heard of was actually developed by the blood tribe in Alberta and he stole it from them um, and there's pictures of him with the blood tribe um, and he actually took what was at the bottom of their triangle and developed it and left off the top, which was actually the community actualization and ultimately the cultural perpetuity, right? So self-actualization is the bottom rung from an indigenous perspective, whereas it's the top rung from a Caucasian Eurocentric perspective. And that changes what we're trying to design in our learning. Um, so I, I, I know that uh, there, I put way more slides than I could possibly get to, but I, I wanted to give you a, a bit of a sense of where the three block model has come from, where are we trying to go with it now to create that more caring, more ensouled world. And that's for the teachers as well as for the students. Um, and at the same time to give credit to the understanding that even though the model is slightly different from what CAS does, it, it is not in contradiction nor in competition. And that's really important for me always when I speak to say, hey, I, I, I step on the shoulders of, you know, I would not be here 
if it wasn't for David Rose and, and Cast, and if it wasn't for Cassell. And so that, that picture of they all have value, I think, is, is what matters. Wow. <laughs> Every time we chat, uh, Jed, you, you send my head spinning too. I, I love um, this phrasing. Um, it, really, when you when you were talking about those residuals of education, right? Those residuals of education don't exist in knowledge currency necessarily. They exist in a bunch of different currencies, right? And and moreover, network affiliation currency and social skills and and soft skill currencies and all these pieces and. Um, I, this this very powerful metaphor from both both of you ladies around the weaving of UDL and the the very personal side of UDL and and I, as I've told you before I love that phrasing building the compassionate classroom that to me is just this it really puts into perspective much like much like when, when Christy was saying it's about um, you know it, it's about it's it's about generosity and it's and it's about um, these pieces, that compassionate classroom really makes it this hu very human centered design that, that, that UDL is building. That to me is, is at its core. We're in human centered work. And so why wouldn't we design in human centered ways? And that means these residuals more than it just means knowledge currency. Oh my goodness. I could, I'd keep on going. Um, but, <laughs> but, but that would just be for me and me being selfish. So I want to turn it over to, uh, I'm going to go in reverse order this time. I'm going to go to Corinne first and see if Corinne's got some questions uh, from our folks out there. And then I'm going to hit Sue up uh, in the Twitterverse. So uh, Corinne, what we got going on out there? Yeah, I do have a couple of questions from the chat here. Um, of course, there is several, um, myself included, wondering about this new book. And when um, I have to admit that I, I, I did take a moment to pop off and see if I could find a release date for that. Um, so a couple of people interested in knowing when we can get our hands on that. Um, and as a follow up to that, also just thinking about that, that idea of when, um, when do we know when those Picassos are born? If you could tell a little story about, you know, one of your most memorable Picassos um, who, who you've had the pleasure of working with in the past. Okay, well, um, the, in terms of the when will the book be ready, the book is at the copy editors at the moment. I hope it will be out in January. It may take till February, but it, it'll be out soon. Um, so that's coming. And it, it really is an expansion of block one in terms of all of the mental health, social and emotional indigenous kinds of perspective, but does also um, look at like treaty education and a number of different pieces as well from a, an academic standpoint and how you can connect well-being to curriculum um, and so that's in there in terms of um, god I have a million <laughs> a million stories of kids but maybe Brian if we can throw the um, the PowerPoint back up I did actually have a little piece from a student at the end close to the end of it that I didn't show because we just didn't have time and maybe this will help people to sort of get an idea of what we're talking about. So if you go down, uh, it's gonna be several slides down, I think. Um, here we go. Okay, so this is, you go back a bit, back a few slides, let's just talk about this for a minute. Back again, there, okay. Uh, so this is actually a grade 12 student we had who um, had come from the Middle East with post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot of different issues, learning English, cultural shock, uh, had been witness to a lot of horrific um, violence um, and, and trauma in a whole lot of different ways. Anyway, um, this piece kind of speaks to, I was working with a teacher who we talked about um, he was trying to teach, quote, the persuasive essay. <laughs> and so sort of backing him up into teaching the idea of persuasion and what it means to be persuasive rather than the sort of five paragraph essay with the topic sentence and, and you know, supporting detail kind of thing. And so we developed this unit. If you go to the next slide, Brian, um, where we showed the students a series of slides that had infographics and a variety of different things about the Syrian refugee crisis. And 
walk through like when did they get convinced it was important and of course it was when the picture of that four-year-old boy who had drowned came up and so we talked about the idea of persuasion of something that moves you to action that that impacts you so much you can't not want to do something um and we went through a number of so we played martin luther king's speech and we did a variety of different things but i know we are running out of time so i don't want to um, take too long with this, but in the end, we asked the students to pick a social issue that they cared about and create a persuasive piece about that. Um, and so if you go forward, Brian, this is, uh, we won't worry about the assessment stuff right now, just keep going. So this young woman um, began by drawing some sketches and then asked for a canvas and so we uh, got a, a canvas and some paints for her. If you go to the next slide, she initially drew it with pencil and then started to fill it in with the colors and go through the next couple, Brian, you'll see how she sort of slowly fills it in. Okay, so this slide is the end slide, it's a little bit distorted, but anyway. And what she explained to us is that this was about the Palestinian-Israeli crisis. And on the left side, what you see is the grieving mothers from both groups. On the right side, what you see is trying to represent that this goes back all the way to biblical times. It's an ancient conflict. And in the middle is the idea of they're actually brothers born of the same mother. Um, and so when we talk about, you know, the Picasso, so to speak, right? And in this case, it actually is a painter, but it could have been anything. That honoring of her gifts and her ways of communicating. And if we had asked her to write a five paragraph essay, forget it, right? But giving her this piece, and we could then teach the essay if we wanted to and say, okay, here's paragraph one, it's an ancient conflict. Here's paragraph two, you know, families are being torn apart. Here's the conclusion, right? But that universal design that mixed in and we took social issues deliberately to bring in that block one social and emotional, you know, service sort of perspective, that's where you see that weaving and this is just an example of that wow <laughs> i've got uh, i got chills around that that's amazing um because i was looking at the slides of course beforehand and i'm like this will be interesting because i can see the progression right but but it's just amazing because that is you're right that's absolutely uh you know that's absolutely an essay Right, it's just in a very visual way. And yes, she could do an, her own critique of her own artwork, right? And be able to write that essay. But how powerful is this? Is this example for that essay? It's, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, Sue, do you have some questions from Twitter for us? Yeah, I do. Actually, I just want to comment on that. You know, when I looked, when I saw that painting, it reminded me of a Diego Rivera mural, you know, just so much information shared in that. I mean, what a story that was, it's very impressive. Um, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, I, I had a question um, from Sue Doner, uh, and I thought this was real insightful, Jennifer. She said um, that your book cover reminded her of Martin uh, Broken Leg's Circle of Courage, and she wonders yeah. if that there was an echo of those four quadrants of belonging, mastery, independence, and generosity. Absolutely, yes. Uh, part of the weaving included the Circle of Courage and that work around resiliency for indigenous learners. And from a UDL perspective, you know, I, I was always saying, okay, how can we do things that the indigenous children in Canada, who most of whom have been exposed to pretty significant trauma, um, intergenerational trauma and so forth, but how do we do it in such a way that both the indigenous and the non-indigenous kids benefit? from this and, and that Martin Brokenleg's work is a perfect example when you're looking at mastery and generosity and you can do that with all the kids, right? And, and so that idea of it's the design for some but of benefit to all, Absolutely. right? Is that, that concept for sure. Yes, his work is part of it and he is cited in the book given credit for that. Well, that's wonderful. 
Yeah. Thank you. Wow. So uh, we are we are coming to the end of our time. So, um, uh, folks, I got to we got to pay some bills. Uh, so let me uh, go ahead and share my screen one more time and give you folks a few reminders of some upcoming things that we got going on. Uh, and then we'll thank our panelists. <clears throat> so uh, the summit, uh, we've mentioned it before and we're going to mention it again. Uh, the summit is on its way, folks. Uh, we've sent out uh, invitations. Uh, we're, we're setting everything up April 25th through the 27th uh, of this year, Orlando, Florida, at the Doubletree, right at the Gates of Universal. Uh, we'll, the summit will be happening. And if you have never been to the summit and only heard rumors of it, I will tell you those rumors are in fact true. It is more than just a conference. It is, it is an experience. It is a great place um, for me, I've always likened it to this. It's kind of like UDL summer camp where you come back and you see your friends from old and you make some new friends and you can sit down with, you know, uh, you can sit down with Jennifer Cage. You can sit down with Chrissy Butler. You can have some dinner. You can break some bread. You can have some deep conversations. Um, and we, and we try to keep it uh, so that everybody is, um, is interacting and, and everybody is, is really sharing the community and the collective. Um, also want to make mention tomorrow night is UDL chat on Twitter. UDL chat happens every first and third Wednesday of the month. Um, and, and we have some really great people that moderate that. Ron Rogers, who I believe is in our chat room today watching the webinar. Um, Mindy Johnson, uh, Miss, Miss UDL Rockstar herself um, is, is a moderator. And in fact, she's moderating tomorrow's. Uh, chat. Um, so we just have some really great people. We have fantastic people that stop in and chat. Elizabeth Stein, Kim Coy, Katie will show, Katie Novak will show up, John Mundorf will show up. It's a great time. It's about a half hour. We do it every first and third Wednesday. It's 9 p.m. Eastern U.S. time. Um, but you can also check out the, the archives of that. Um, and it is, it is completely volunteer. Um, so, uh, you know, we try to give them as much love from the IRN as we possibly can. Tomorrow's topic, uh, visible thinking and its place with UDL and how those two intersect and, and weave with each other. It's a great time and, and some great people. Um, so one last time, I, I, from the bottom of my heart, and, and I speak on behalf of our our viewers as well. Thank you so much to Chrissy Butler and thank you so much to Dr. Jennifer Cates uh, for, for taking this hour and spending this time with us and really kind of showing us where UDL is in the world. But I think moreover, also showing us how small UDL is, right? Like as a movement, how small it is and, and, and how great that is that it's small and how it is, uh, it's really a communal effort and it's a collective effort and it's about human design and it's about humanity at its center. Um, so, so ladies, I just want to tell you, thank you again, uh, so very much, uh, really appreciate the conversation and you always blow my mind. Thank Do you. Do you have any final thoughts? No, Hi, just it was wonderful. We had so many nice comments in the chat. Um, we really appreciate it both on Twitter and, um, uh, in our, in our, uh, panelist chat too. So thank you again, ladies, very much. Yeah. And if you right, folks, you. folks, if out there in the in, in viewing this, if you want to show this to your friends, your colleagues, if you want us to have a, a Friday night viewing party, please feel free to. This will be up uh, very soon on our own website, uh, udlirn.org. Um, also check out uh, Jennifer Cates' website, threeblockmodel.com uh, and uh, Chrissy's coreeducation.org. Uh, Make sure that you check those out uh, and dive through just the great stuff that's on there. And check out our own site so to register and also to watch these and our other uh, IRN network and learns. With that, everybody, thank you again. Have a great evening. And thank you to our panelists and everybody else involved.